All right, hi, and welcome to the Skeptical Leftist Podcast, the show where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm joined by Lucretia McEvil. Thanks for joining me. Hey, everybody. How's it going? It's awesome to be here. Uh, this is, I did an interview, my first interview a couple of weeks ago, so, but I think this is my first like podcast ah. style interview. <laughs> so I'm really excited. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. Oh, for sure. You're in the big leagues now. <laughs> yeah, that's what it feels like. <laughs> All right on. So uh, I, my initial question I always like to ask is, uh, who are you and what do you want people to know about you? Sure. Um, well, uh, on the internet, I go by Lucretia McEvil, but I'm Destiny. I am an artist and activist. I guess that would be my main identity. Um, I feel like those things are in tandem with each other. Um, I'm always going to speak about something and be creative. I think that's just my my journey in life, we'll say. <laughs> um and what was the second part? Sorry. What do you want people to know about you? <laughs> oh, what what do people uh what do I want people to know about me? Uh I want people to know that I'm always uh talking about uh things in the world and reality from a good place because I believe in decolonization and I want us to be free. So <laughs> That's just like my main goal with with my art and my activism, I guess. That's awesome. I uh, one of the best compliments I ever got about uh, the show is that they somebody said they know they may not always agree with me, but they know I'm coming from a, a principled place. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah that, I mean, I'm, I've got an ideological goal, I guess, and that's I'm kind of open with that. That's awesome. Yeah, I've I've gotten that feedback in life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, people have always said that about me. They're like, well, one thing about about them, you know, they they stick to their guns. And I consider that a compliment. Um, yeah. All the people I look up to in like history and um, like throughout the world, music or whatever, they seem to have a similar type of uh, feeling about them. So I feel like we're in good company. Yeah. It's important to stand up for what you believe in, right? Absolutely. I I feel like it's worse when you don't. I know people <laughs> live in fear, uh, but like you have to feel the fear and kind of do it anyway, you know, like, and once yeah. you get over that, like it becomes a muscle, like people like who stand up and like speak up, like they, the reason why it looks so easy for them is because they've been doing it for a long time. You know what I right. mean? Like, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you have to sure. start doing it. It's like exercising. Yeah. You gotta. You ha at some point, you gotta start. It's gonna be hard at first, but it won't always be as hard. You know. Yeah. That's at least sure. how I approach speaking up about stuff. That's fair. <laughs> My partner even says, like, with people that are like way off on the wrong side of things, uh, like, be proud of your shitty opinions. Be proud. Stand up for it at least, instead of mealy mouthing and pretending you're something you're not. Right. Oh, absolutely. I agree with that 100%. Like, I have said that often, just as a black person, like, I would rather someone be outwardly racist to me, um, instead of like making their, their guilt about their opinions, like my problem, like, that's right. not my psychological ballot, like baggage <laughs> to carry. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's yours. So like, if you want to feel that way, like, go for it. At least I know to stay away from you. But when you're ambiguous like that, and like, I don't really know, like, like yeah. that, that makes it more dangerous for me. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I know a snake when I see one, but like, yeah. badges are different. Badges are cuddly, but they can kill you. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, they look like they're furry little animals, but right. <laughs> yeah, that's that's how I describe white liberalism, I guess. Like, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> to like a badger. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I guess, uh. What political ideology do you identify with? Sure. So I've been an anarchist since I was like 15 or 16 years old. Um, it's always been the one that I've felt the closest aligned to. Uh -huh. I read the Communist Manifesto back then. Okay. But even back then, I was like, why not no laws? Like, <laughs> <laughs> why not transfer the power to everybody? You know, yeah. even in my little like 
teenage inarticulate way of things. And even before I even knew what anarchism was, I just as a neurodivergent child, um, before I knew it, I saw everybody on the same sort of mm. playing field and as equals. And it would get me in trouble a lot because I would go up to adults and talk to them like they were humans <laughs> but right. as an adult, uh, like as a small child. And like, there's always like a hierarchy going on that I didn't fully understand. Um, and I guess as an autistic person, really having to be so hyper aware of the uh, hierarchy made me so against it. You know what right. I mean? Like that, that's where that sort of conviction comes from for me. Um, and outside of anarchism, I always say I'm an intersectional feminist because I believe that if we approach these things just through an, an analysis of like class or um, just race or just whatever oppression, we're not seeing the, the full picture of everything. Right. Yeah. That that's always made the same, uh, the most sense to me. Like, I don't know about uh, like the, the person who made the, use the term intersectional first. I don't, I know like people like to nitpick people's past or whatever, but I'm like, but it doesn't matter if we can use it and it's a useful idea to say like, yes, there's sexism, there's racism, there's, uh, you know, sexuality, there's various politics and issues within all that. And class is part of that. Like, I don't see why that's, you know, identity politics. <laughs> right, right. When people, I personally think when people say it's identity politics, that's listening to the framework of like the right. Like, yeah. Yeah. To to say like people are like being that way is to assume that like these experiences aren't valid. You know what I mean? Like right. this is just my reality as a black person. Like if I'm not allowed to speak about it, that means you don't want to hear about my reality. That yeah. like I said before, that's more of a you problem than a me problem. For sure. Uh, and I think people in society they like will try to like articulate in certain ways to like absolve themselves of the responsibility to like sit with really uncomfortable things you know what i mean um yeah, yeah i'm always arguing with white leftists because they think that because they understand class analysis that they understand race analysis right. it's like okay name the black authors you've read right Cricket, always <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean or like, yeah so no that's yeah, fair yeah Wait, what were you going to say? Sorry. I was just going to say, yeah, like I, I, I actually didn't come to the class side of things. I started off learning about anti-racism. I read Ibram X. Kendi and uh, Carol Anderson and like Robin Maynard from Canada. And I was like, oh, OK, so this sucks for black people in, <laughs> in North America, for sure. And then I started learning more about class politics by with, through my friend Justin, who is like a Marxist. So then I was like, oh, well, this. This is part of that, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is all together. And of course, I, I uh, was this also reading about learning about feminism from like, uh, I guess, Anita Sarkeesian. She used to do the, the gamer tropes video. And uh, I know everybody hates her online, but, <laughs> but I was always a big fan. No, nah, totally. Yeah, I think that's, I personally think that's a better way to go about learning about the world because like the reason why we have the structure with class is because of race first you know what i mean like people really have to learn about the the history of like how whiteness was actually created like right. white was not something that always was they invented it in the 1600s yeah. and then the same time frame they invented blackness they invented blackness in the 1600s also so once you realize that then of course it's always going to come to class next because like that's why they did it you know they needed an underclass of people to exploit for money so right when when white leftists or just non-black leftists in general try to separate themselves from racism or anti-blackness i'm like you you can't like there's no yeah. way that we're ever going to get to the solution <laughs> of liberation for all people unless black liberation is included because sure. black liberation includes all people, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's why it's yeah. important to not separate it from whatever other identity people can be intertwined with. Like, for instance, like black liberation includes the liberation of the incarcerated, the disabled, women, right. queer people, trans people, 
lower class but you know what i mean like and we have examples of it in history with like the civil rights act like (laughs) these aren't things that are made up you know and it's because of the caste system but i fear that a lot of people a don't know that we're in a caste system or b they're like too afraid to acknowledge it because that means they have to acknowledge their place in it and like right yeah their complacency yeah and that's i mean that's hard i don't want to deny that but it's like we do have to make progress somehow. Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> I, I agree that it's hard. I just think, I think there's like spaces for it to be discussed, you know? Like, I feel like, uh, I mean, it depends. Like, uh, what's her name? Like, Robin D'Angelo. I know oh, she's yeah. like uh, an author who like helps um, like cultivate spaces for white people to like decolonize their mind and like deconstruct racism. And I think those things are really important. But I think more of where I'm coming from is like there's a danger in like talking to people who are experiencing the reason about it um yeah. but in general I know that people are just trying to connect with each other so there just has to be a balance I guess about when and how we say things these are just things that are always on my mind I guess yeah. I'm still unpacking them there's no real answer yet I guess but I, I yeah I think like you say like it's always um progress in motion thought in motion right like we're always adapting to what new information is coming in and like uh one of the things i noticed like i think it, i think it was robin dn maybe i'm wrong uh who the person who came up with white fragility yeah yeah that's her yeah, that's her okay yeah i know a lot of people like who are like class analysis mainly they like to they don't they dismiss her perspective because mm-hmm. she like does workshops at corporations and whatnot and you go well but white fragility is a real thing like it doesn't matter where she's doing this work it's a thing that we see out in real life all the time so how can you just dismiss that because it doesn't fit your quote-unquote class analysis right right but that's the thing like she um and you just reminded me of something i was going to say before about um you were talking about um the person who made intersectionality, like that's Dr. Kimberly Cradshaw. She went to Ivy League school. So same with Robert D'Angelo. They're both liberals, like they're right. neoliberals. <laughs> yeah. But that doesn't mean that what they're saying isn't true. Obviously, there's always ways, like you said, progress in motion. We should definitely keep pushing and expanding. And I've seen people online say instead of white fragility, we should say, we should call it something else that like places a little bit more responsibility on white people and i'm okay and open with that but like the concept of it in itself is important for people to learn right like yeah yeah so, I think so. like we can always keep advancing theory um and it's important too but there has to be a ta- a, a beginning stage you know like somebody has to say the hard thing um but yeah like i i feel like <laughs> And that might be a little bit why, like, sometimes I get annoyed with the left because I feel like sometimes there's, like, a morality contest or, like, a purity contest with certain mm. concepts. But I do believe even we can we can learn from people who aren't on the left, too, you know, yeah. about certain things. I know that's, like, a radical <laughs> thing to maybe say out loud. Like, Whoa. Yeah. like, oh, no, we listen to a neoliberal. But, yeah, I mean, if they're making an impact in the global consciousness of, like, people... Yeah. Yes, it matters. Yeah. You know, uh, if we can incorporate their theory into our framework, then it may, you know, and adapt it. Like it doesn't have to be exactly what they say, but yeah. Right. Absolutely. And it helps, even though we don't like to admit it, like we know the truth about reality as anarchists. You know, we <laughs> read, we know that this has been the world for a long time, but. Yeah people won't validate people like us without people like them. That's yeah, like an exactly. unfortunate truth also, you know, like yeah. no one's going to listen to Noam Chomsky until he became Ivy League Noam Chomsky. Yeah, you know, that's I mean, right. Cornell yeah. West wasn't listened to until he became Dr. Cornell West, you know? Yeah. So that's just yeah. the reality of the world we're in, you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's like, cause I'm, I'm a laborer, right? Like I just work in, the oil field actually oh shit well thank (laughs) you that's crazy (laughs) so so i uh i do that and then like i try to slowly radicalize the people that i work with (laughs) but when i'm talking in radical spaces or if i'm talking in like liberal spaces then they just dismiss me right out 
the gate. Like, oh, you're a working class anarchist. Like, what do you fucking know, right? <laughs> right. <Of course. laughs> you don't have an education. Like, <laughs> so. Absolutely. Yeah. And it sucks because, like, I, similar background, like, I'm working class. My, um, my family's from Brooklyn, though, on both sides. So I grew up inner city working class person. But because I lived in New York, I had a privilege that most other working class uh, kids in different cities don't have because we had access to like art museums and the New York Public Library, which is one of the best library systems in the whole world. So like I got access to education and things like that, which allowed me to find my way into these like bourgeoisie spaces. Uh-huh. And then when I get there, they they hear me and my intelligence, but they they notice that I'm not one of them for whatever reason. Apparently, rich people know that we're not rich because of the way we hold our forks or some shit. Like, oh, probably <laughs> fuck. I that's, what I heard. <laughs> that's what I heard. They, like, I heard somebody say that once that they could always tell when somebody's poor because we hold it like like grip it, which yeah. is hilarious. Um, we, but what we hold it like a shovel instead of like a. Right, right. We hold like a shovel and it's like, okay, I'm hungry. This is for sustenance. Um, yeah, that's right. Not for showing off. But yeah, when you get into those spaces and you make it for whatever reason, like you make it there, they still know that I'm not one of them. Yeah. And I don't want to be one of them. That's why yeah. I left. Like, that's why yeah. I left. Like, there's no way that I'm betraying my class for yeah. this. There's nothing good about any of what I was doing. <laughs> I promise you. Like I, I regret most of it. I grew as a as a designer, but um yeah, I the things yeah. that people accept in their day to day is just really hard for me to wrap my hand around as an anarchist. And probably for you as well. I won't presume to project, but I find that most people who identify with anarchism are willing to take risks for their political uh you know affiliation yeah. or what they believe in they're not going to go to you know they're they're willing to walk off a job that mistreats them they're willing to speak up about certain things and like there's just certain things that people have really conditioned themselves to like be yeah. okay with that i think is just like yeah it's, it's funny like a different language <laughs> it's funny that you say that because i actually did like i i worked the same job i did before but uh in I think it was 2020 or 2021, somewhere in there, they were like, no, we want to move you to a different facility and the schedule changes to this. And I was like, I looked at it and I was like, well, I'll never see my kids then. So either we change the schedule or I got to quit. <laughs> they exactly. were like, oh, we can't change the schedule. So I said, okay, well, I got to quit then. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> it's really that simple for, yeah. for I, I find that's just my humorous perspective. I find it's easier because, yeah, we've we've accepted that it's like kind of always going to be like this. Right. You know? Yeah. They're always going to try to push you past your limit. They're always going to try to exploit you. So if you stay, they're just going to keep pushing you, keep pushing you, keep pushing you. So you just got to leave. You have to choose yourself. And like, yeah, it's scary to do that. Absolutely. Is, yeah. But like I said before, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. You yeah, know, that's right. Um. And to your point, oh, sorry. Well, I was just going to say, I keep telling the guys at work, we trade our time for a wage. They don't own us. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. I was going to actually talk about you uh, talking to the the guys at your work. I find um, that it's easier to talk to people in labor, like construction workers and iron workers and all, all. I find it so much easier to radicalize them than mm. other people because they're so close to the point already especially yeah. if they're already union like you have oh, like yeah oh my goodness you have like <laughs> five steps to like radicalize them it take you know what i mean like just get them in a corner for 30 minutes <laughs> and they're like <laughs> yeah. oh wait no you're making so much sense but like uh yeah i find that in my experience it was always easy to to make people understand like concepts of anarchism or socialism if they worked in like construction. Right. Um, I had a friend who was an iron worker who was like very conservative until I started talking to him. Like same way that you do at your at your job where you're like, do you know that they can't do anything without you? Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. And then he's like, wait a second, you're right. <laughs> like you're yeah. the one risking your life on buildings. You know what I mean? Like Yeah, for sure. You can take ownership and pride in that, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, the world workers runs right. on workers. That's <laughs> that's how it goes. Always. Yeah, but, yeah. And that's that's something you can't ever uh, get rid of. And like in corporate, that was my first experience with it. I can't believe I even tried. Um, <laughs> yeah, they 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 want you to like just yield to that. Yeah, yeah. And and it's all insidious too, you know, like the double speak and this is right. this is a inclusive environment and you know like all the bullshit like it's just <laughs> it reminds me of get out like genuinely like oh, I plan yeah. on, I, I would have voted for obama, obama twice <laughs> right the third term <laughs> yeah. it's too much it's too yeah. much so yeah i'd rather just be working class and stay here because i know the exp- the expectations i have more solidarity with other people yeah. and there's more commonality that uh yeah i just i don't know i <laughs> i know that i don't know if other anarchists or other leftists feel that way but like i yeah i, I yeah i've never had i don't know about like, again i can't speak for other people but i've never had uh like the the ambition to good above being a worker i i'm quite content where i am uh in a lot of ways and i'm sure <laughs> I'm sure my my boss doesn't want to, you know, me saying that uh, this stuff to people, but I just I'm fine with where I'm working. I just don't think being in management is going to be advantageous to my life. I, right. I work to live. I don't live to work. <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. And I, yeah, absolutely. I felt the same way too. But like I said, I'm a graphic designer, and then I did this uh, program where it was like a free night school for people of color um and they wanted to like teach us the industry and that's where i got brainwashed ah, right? yeah. that's where yeah. it happened yeah <laughs> it was this is other... a special course for you to learn right. about where yes. you can fit in here yeah yeah and it was <laughs> other marginalized people from like people who are also from new york or other oh, cities yeah. in my experience knowing where i came from grew up and telling me that i belong and that we can change things and we were making disruptive work and then they're showing me stuff that's actually happening because this is like post 2020. So like ah. at the time they were actually actively getting projects funded and mutual aid projects lift off the ground. So I'm like, right. yeah, this is a neoliberal hellscape, but like maybe I can do some real work here somewhere. For some reason, I thought I was going to be like in Star Wars where I would dress up like a stormtrooper and be able to <laughs> I thought I would be able to evade any sort of like yeah. nonsensory but there's yeah there's no way in doing that and yeah like I I really over the course of the year it really made me accept uh that the analysis that I have, have made and other anarchists have made is correct right about the- <laughs> the means and ends. Yes, we, we were right. Like you know what I mean. Like Karl Marx was actually spitting. Like it's not just theory. Like yeah, uh, the means of production. Like we are the means of production, and we we are the needle, and we're not going to get any sort of progress from them whatsoever. Yeah. Even if they're telling you with their mouths that they understand, they are doing it to pacify us you know yeah, and i got caught right. up in it um but it was a good reality and gut check for me because it makes me feel more of a fire in myself because i know what i'm supposed to be doing like yeah you know like i've always been trying to be the comfortable artist and activist that i am but was always kind of like i was saying before we started like people don't like listening to anarchists yeah. they don't <laughs> they don't like what we have to say um but yeah just but we always turn out to be right in the end. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so our reality checks is like, wait a second, no. So I'm just going to work on living my life as much outside of capitalism and this ex- exploitive system as I can through yeah. what I've always known was correct. Mutual aid, community care, support, loving people, creating art, connecting like we are, you know, like this is what's important, not yeah. me making a banner or a car commercial or whatever you know, like, <laughs> right. yeah none of that matters <laughs> yeah i find it's like because i i work in the oil field i work in a i'm i'm actually like pretty privileged with the income that i get from that and i i'm often torn 
about the balance that I'm trying to strike between my my activism, my beliefs, my propaganda that I'm putting out and the job that I do, which is part of the oil industry, which damages the environment is part of the whole problem. And, you know, feeding my family, keeping a roof over. It. <laughs> like it's, it's like, I, I'm often torn with this kind of balance. And I think doing the show is kind of one of the ways that I try and deal with that. But also like, yeah, it's not, it's like, it's not, I don't find a bad thing that you necessarily fell for their propaganda, right? Because we all have to somehow fit in here and survive at the same time as we're doing what we care about. Oh, yeah, totally. I appreciate you sharing that because, yeah, I feel very similarly. And you're right. It's just like, it's like when you get duped and you're like, oh, dang it. Like, <laughs> y'all <laughs> yeah. got me. I read about this. I know better. But y'all yeah. still got me, you know? Like, that's more of where it's coming from where I'm like, oh, whatever, dude. But, like, in the same sense of you, like, I felt the same way about advertising as well. Because, like, these companies are making military contracts with people. Right. And <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in the office. I'm like, I just want to be a graphic designer. And you're asking me to make a banner for a military contractor. Like, Thanks, I'm see? absolutely yeah. never going to do that. Like, yeah. obviously, I told them no. And that was one of the things that led to me leaving. But like the fact that they even asked when they told me when I got hired and they knew that I was an activist, they were like, if you ever feel like any of the projects we give you are like against your principles, you can totally tell us no. But then when I say no, you're like, oh, they're being difficult. Like, which one is it? <laughs> right. You know? So that's why I'm like, yeah. I, what do you I mean? agree with you. This is, you told I, me I could say no. <laughs> right. That's why I agree with you, where it's like, it's, it's definitely a balance. And like, this is stuff that everybody has to deal with, you know, yeah. not just yeah. us and not just anarchists. Like, they know that the world is messed up. And that there's a lot going on, but they have to like reconcile it. And it's meant to be that way, you know, like they, they yeah. make it this way on purpose. Like that's why there is a cast because like if you're doing okay, you're not gonna really want to rock the boat because you're doing yeah. okay. Like, yeah. um, and that's, that's a part of it. And same, same with you. Like this is a part of why I'm making videos and content as well, because I want to put out propaganda that like, helps people understand that they can opt out right of, of things mm -hmm. that don't serve them and like even though it is scary like you don't have to you don't have to choose the lesser of two evils like look at yeah. what that has gotten us you know just evil on both sides <laughs> yeah it's just evil everything's evil <laughs> yeah. yeah for sure i uh yeah it's weird <laughs> <laughs> sure is we live yeah. in a weird world uh so i guess uh we've already covered like how your ideology manifests in your life because you kind of <laughs> you quit your job because it didn't fit with how you your activism and that's that's i think that's i mean we say it's a, a, a easy per se but it's also a brave thing to do it's it's not because you're sacrificing like potential well-being right so I hope that you're still doing well, at least after after quitting that job. I appreciate that. I, I'll be all right. I've like as a working class person, I've figured it out. And that's kind of what helped, led me to the decision to do it. It's like I'm miserable and I'm making so-called good money when I wasn't miserable, when I was making less money. Right. I'll be right. fine. <laughs> yeah. That helped that helped me uh, inform the decision. And, and yeah, um. Yeah, that honestly just comes from like my experiences growing up, like, like I said, of, um, from the projects and I was homeless as a kid and that helped radicalize me, honestly. Like I, I tell people all the time, like, you don't have to read theory. I'm, I'm sure you obviously know this, but you don't have to read theory to know anarchism or Marxist principles. And right. before I even knew the words of, you know, the Communist Manifesto or like reading all the things that I... I did and learning all the things I knew. I knew that that this system was broken, you know, when I was nine, when I was homeless. Like, right. So that, you know, unfortunately, it, tra it traumatized me. But that in, in the way that I spin it for the positive for myself in my life is it allows me to walk away from things 
earlier that makes me feel like that in any way. And also it makes me think, how how worse can it be? I was homeless as a child. You're not going to scare me. You know that's what I mean? Right. I, know, yeah. I know that's not everybody's experience, but that's how I get yeah, that's I, making I, big decisions. Right. No, I think that's how it's tough for people who are middle class ish, right? Like they they grew up in a privileged community in a you know a nice house because their parents made good money, and then they get a job and they make good money, and it's it's like, well, I'm doing okay, my parents did okay, and they don't see the problems the same way as a person who maybe experienced poverty at one point in their life. Like when I was in my twenties, I uh, I lived in like a little tiny little hovel with like three of my buddies and we all paid we all split the 215 dollars of rent because that's all we could figure out there was no work for us so yeah struggle yeah, yeah i mean it's a thing right yeah when you're when I, you're on that side of it it's it's easier to see the issues absolutely yeah that's it's so true and i think it's like you said with man like <laughs> I think that's probably why you're like, you never wanted to become a middle manager because like, that's a part of it. And that's, that's a part of why I left. <laughs> Cause when you get to that level, they want you to be pacified. They're like, okay, everything's fine now. Yeah. You have insurance, you get your, your check every two weeks, you know, the amount of money you're going to get and you get paid uh, uh, um, time off. You can, you can do what you want with that and you're fine. Right. And that's what they want you to concede to that no, you should no longer complain because now you have PTO or whatever. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. I've never even taken a vacation before by myself in my whole life. You're not threatening me with a good time. You know, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I, can, yeah. I can just walk away from that. But if someone has experienced vacations, that's, that's something that they think they don't want to lose. Yeah. That's a privilege that they don't want to lose. Or like what you were saying with them living in a nice house, they're going to be more willing to concede because they have that nice house they they don't want to lose. They yeah. it's easier for people to get roped into the propaganda of it all when they are middle management or when they're in the middle of the cast. Yeah. I was kind of talking to someone about this earlier um about like how white immigrants kind of like forgot some of their heritage, like you know how like Irish people or Italian people or even Persian or Turkish people because they're now considered white. Right. Um kind of like rejected their race i like their racialized identities to conform to the class and it's because they're in the middle the middle management we'll call it <laughs> they're yeah, in the middle management sure. section where it's like you still experience oppression obviously because you're irish because you're italian right because you're turkish um but because you're also white, now you get benefits that you didn't before, and yeah. you don't want to go back to what was happening. It's all it's all on purpose, you know. For sure, for sure. Yeah, I I think that's something that a lot of people didn't recognize until I don't know. There was a video that went around on Facebook, and all of a sudden, all my friends. I think it was 2014, 2013. All my friends were like, "Oh my God, this is what created whiteness. This is where the police came from." <laughs> like, like, yeah, this is. Pretty nasty stuff, but yeah, totally. I think that's like really important for people to know, like, and there's a reason that it's being suppressed, right? Like, they don't want like white working class people to recognize, yeah. like, you're a pawn because then, then it will be Bacon's Rebellion. You know, they don't, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they don't want that again. Then yeah. we would have John Brown again. You know what I mean? Right. Like, exactly. <laughs> yeah. They don't, there's a reason why it's being suppressed, but that's also why it's important for people who do create content and make propaganda to make it like easier, easily accessible. Um, right. That's like my main goal is like, I think the, the, the way that we achieve anarchism in our day to day is like when you hear like someone's grandma on the corner, basically <laughs> saying anarchist principles in like layman's terms, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, or when when it's just normal to expect like community care from each other, like that's when we've made it. Not when everybody can like, yeah, riff on I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Leninism or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Like it, it's well, I, and I appreciate people who have that ability to like you know recite the history of Leninism and whatnot because I know I don't have that. 
but totally. <laughs> but but I do uh, I do appreciate them, but I also like I do I definitely appreciate like the people who just say like okay, yeah, you're being oppressed because they're making profits off of your labor and they're not paying you what you're making, and that's just straightforward. <laughs> like, totally, I I I get that um that feeling because of like the Black Panther Party, right? Like they deliberately uh made sure all of their uh, printed material was accessible because they knew at the time that the literacy rate in the black community was pretty low because you got to remember like with the sixties, there were people who probably their, their grandparents or parents were slaves right. um, yeah. at that time. Uh, so the literacy rate at that time was pretty low in the black community. So intentionally they made things at a really, um, easily understandable level and make sure everything had images and pictures in it. So I think right. that's like the, the most simple way to articulate our points. Um, and I like to your point, I really love when people can recite these things. Like I'm always listening to like Noam Chomsky lectures. Like that's like right. <laughs> one of my favorite things to do. Actually, I'll like put on like someone smarter than me and just like listen to them talk yeah. on YouTube when I'm like designing something or doing something. But yeah, I think our job, at least like me and you as leftist content creators, is to take what they're saying and then make it as simple as possible for right. people to get, yeah. you know? Like yeah. where like even like my nephew could be like, This is what this is, you know. Oh, I get it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I like that quite a bit. I yeah, it's funny. I, I also tend to watch people or listen to people who are, I can, I consider them smarter than me. I don't, I don't know them personally, but <laughs> I'm like, this person is at, at least very good at making educational content that I can understand. So hopefully right, I right. can <laughs> translate into a way that somebody, you know, without even my level of reading ha can understand. No, for sure. Um, so I guess one of the things I like to ask people is like, uh, what are some of the things you might say to someone to convince them of that anarchism is the right way to view the world <sighs> wow that's <laughs> i mean you gave me that question before and i thought about it but it's still so heavy like it I really, is it's tough eh because it depends on the situation that. i guess right yeah totally um i guess my biggest thing or at least what i've been like thinking about lately um even when us talking about like work and stuff like that is the concept like of fear holding you back really mm. like I feel like that's where I'm at right now. Like if I really had to sit down with someone who didn't understand anarchism or why I was an anarchist, I would talk to them about fear and how important it is to not let fear hold us back on a, from a world that we know yeah. that we haven't had yet, um, but can be possible. Um, that's where I would begin because um, I feel like the most pushback that we get is it, it's coming from a place of fear there's valid criticisms of anarchism of course like i have to concede to that even though it makes me a little annoyed to be like yeah okay that's kind of utopian whatever dude um but um i think it's important to still dream you know like i yeah. think it's, it's coming from a place of fear of not believing that we can do it to think that we're like just being utopian or like frivolous and thought like why why can't all of us be free like why is that such an insane concept to people yeah and it's because we're so indoctrinated to think that there has to be a hierarchy you know like there has to be somebody who's free and somebody else who has the keys you know yeah. like yeah it's, it's like they fair. it's like they stole our imagination right yeah <laughs> like we cannot conceive of a world that's even slightly better than the one we're in yeah, exactly. That's my main point. Yeah, exactly. And that's how you know that we're like, I think I saw something that said the, the wealth disparity is worse than it was during feudalism. Like we're, right. we're worse than peasants, which that's what really broke my brain. I was like, because <laughs> we call people peasants because of how our things were for them. So yeah. you're telling me I'm worse than a peasant? What is worse than a peasant? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty tough, eh? And they tough. say also that we, we on average, people work harder than they did during the feudal era. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so it's like, to your point, they stole our imagination. And like, that's something that peasants dealt with too. Like, they could not conceive of yeah. a world 
where the royals were not their number one priority. Like they they did not know that was possible. Right. But feudalism ended, you know? Yep. So that's something that I want people to keep in mind. Like I know everyone has a loss of hope. I have loss of hope all the time, but we we really have to try not to stay there. Like I don't think yeah. nihilism's gonna serve us in the end. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's okay to not like I don't know. I think pessimism is a more healthy approach <laughs> to right. think i'm i'm expecting the worst but i'm still gonna try my best you know that's also like a little <laughs> yeah. stoic too uh like and buddhist if we're throwing out other philosophies so like really sure. just understanding like this is the suffering is kind of a part of it you know and yeah. it sucks nobody should have to deal with it but like if we really want a greater a greater world we have to accept that like it's just something we have to like suffer through you know like yeah it takes yeah we're not there now so we have to do the transition right however that looks and it's going to be hard i guess yeah we're in the transition period honestly it's like and it sucks <laughs> we all deserve to live in a world where it's already good you know yeah what's that um, they all you know it gets worse before it gets better kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. Exactly. It gets worse before it gets better. But yeah, I think that's important why we just need to keep referencing history. Like people just don't know that other people have been successful in their attempts of anarchism, even if they were short lived. Right. Um, like I love learning about the Spanish Civil War because I didn't at first like I knew about it, but I didn't realize uh, how large of a scale yeah. They were controlling entire cities. Like yeah. what you know what I mean? So when I hear stuff like that, I get so excited because it's like it's possible. We can do that again, but we have to start. It has to start with you and your friends. Or even you like, have to go start, you know, a mutual aid thing or whatever. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Or even like uh you think like they may not identify as anarchists, but they're similar in their non hierarchical nature is like even like the Zapatists. Zapatistas yeah. or like uh, Rojava or, you know, there's various projects all over the world that are like that, that they seem small because they're not the United States or, you know, right. they're not 30 million people or whatever, or 300 million people, but they're projects that are being successful and they're maintaining themselves long term. So it's pretty nice. Absolutely. And especially as anarchists, we have to respect any project that is organized and last for a couple years or more <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah. <laughs> it is impossible to organize people sometimes so when we see successful long-standing projects that means they're doing something correct and we should pay attention to them learn from them and expand on the projects that we're doing um that reminds me of like occupy wall street right that was like the mm. first uh activism thing that i did i was 18 19 years old um and i got to go down there and like see everybody and how well organized it was um it fell apart terribly because like some of the more nefarious characters started coming in we had opposition from the right the police um the wealthy people on wall street who didn't want people there and then there was like people who came with like their agendas and stuff but it yeah. was a successful project for a couple i don't even remember how long it was a couple months yeah for we a little were, while yeah we were out there for a couple months but it reminds me of like the encampments that students are making across the universities now yeah like, which is going on learned, for a while now yeah exactly and i'm so proud of them because they learned from seeing things like occupy wall street how yeah. to take over a space and stay there and claim it as your own so like you can learn from the mistakes of the past while using their frameworks you know like Sure. We can we can fix how things like uh, the Spanish Civil War and other projects of uh, anarchism or Marxism failed by, like, correcting our infighting and closing our ranks and stuff like that, because that's what divided them, you know? Yeah. Um, they end up accusing each other of being <laughs> Nazis, and then they let the real Nazis in, and then, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see history repeating itself. Yeah. Or you accuse Currently. everybody of being a fed and then you ignore the actual like feds that are infiltrating your area. Like, oops. That's a part of, yeah, <laughs> that's a part of what I wanted to talk a little bit about too. Cause that's 
actually happened like i don't know if you've seen like the the mass bans that have been happening across the country now um and it's directly in relation to the fact that they know that yeah i actually now that i think about it yeah yeah Yeah. yeah. (laughs) people on the left are a most likely going to mask because mm-hmm. of litigation against COVID, and B, they're masking because they're at Palestine, Palestine protests, and they don't want to get any surveillance on them. Yep. But now they're trying to ban masks. And the talking point of them saying that, literally, I heard leftists on TikTok maybe four or five months ago saying that if you wear a mask at a protest, you're a fed. <laughs> and those videos went viral, Corey. I promise you, like 100,000. That guy's a fed. That guy's yeah. a fed. Like, <laughs> so like i see that now and i'm like they they got that talking point from yeah. from us infighting you know like, yeah <laughs> we yeah, need to, that's, that's we need no to good. find a solution i remember like years and years ago i think it was like the g20 summit uh there was like uh all the a, a bunch of the protesters that that wore masks and so in canada there was like a movement in the pol- politics and like policing and whatnot to ban masks then And then, like, so that made masks even better on the left. We were all like, oh, masks are good, right? And then people are arguing against masks when we're trying to wear them for COVID. And you go, well, well, masks have been cool because they... (laughs) Like, what happened? wear masks all the time. (laughs) That was our whole thing, right? (laughs) We all, I mean, that's, that's just me making another joke about the separation between, like, the left and anarchists though because like we've always liked mass yeah anarchists like <laughs> we, we that's a kind of our whole thing the t-shirt mask like <laughs> masks are good actually come on <laughs> we love ski masks we love those we yeah. like <laughs> yeah the the facial recognition software that they're trying to use now everywhere too it's like like masks and sunglasses that's how you avoid that right if you're if you just go out with like although i guess it's pretty racist software still at this point so it kind of thinks all black people are the same <laughs> like, it's like i don't yeah. know what I, like i know i heard many stories about guys getting arrested because some facial recognition software identified them when they were nowhere near the crime right right i've heard the same things and like they still get convicted and go and like after the fact that's when they're like oh wait a second these aren't the same people yeah but they accepted it up until then because they are already assuming that person's guilt because they're a black person yeah, yeah. ai like the <laughs> the the only reason why i thought ai was a good idea in the slightest is because of accessibility for like disabled people right but this is not what they're using it for no, in that's any right. shape or form whatsoever i saw something i forget where maybe um it was a european um publication maybe uh what is that um bbc yeah there we go they're talking about how a company i forget which one is trying to figure out how to use ai to give people um prison time so instead of making people go to prison for 10 years they want to figure out a way to inject 10 years of prison time into your consciousness. What? They're doing trials already. That's wild. <laughs> They're already doing trials. So this is some Black Mirror stuff. That's like, not cool at all. It's not cool at all. Like, this is what we're using AI for. Like, we're using AI for drones. <laughs> yeah. We're using yeah. AI to arrest innocent people. And we're going to use AI to incarcerate people faster. Israel is using uh, uh, AI to determine who might be Hamas or not. Yeah, I heard that not that long ago. Like, <laughs> and and it, even in testing, they found that it's like identifying children and babies and like anybody that isn't like identifiably white skin is, is considered Hamas by this AI. And it's like, no, that's fucked up. It's it's so fucked up. And like the main point of it is, is because we live in a society that people have inherent bias. So the people who are making these algorithms, because, yeah, once the algorithm is created, it's kind of like on its own. It'll do its own thing. Right. But yeah. if you make the algorithm 
with your bias, it's going to keep perpetuating that bias. You know what I mean? So yeah. hearing that Israel is doing that, you know, they did that with intention is my first thought. It's like they, right. they intentionally were like all brown people are Hamas. So they can yeah. just use that to prove their point, you know, like. Yeah, because people give somehow using the AI gives it legitimacy, right? Like it's, oh, right. but it's an algorithm. It's like computer. It's got to be objective, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Nonsense. Horrible. Yeah. I, I, it, that's what makes me sad. Like, instead of the innovation of humanity being for, like, good, like, it's like the most cartoon villain, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Shit that you never thought would be humanly possible type of stuff, you know? Yeah. But I still believe in a better future for us. Like, I have to. I have to hold on to it. Like, I was saying before, like, yeah. pessimism is what keeps me going, not nihilism. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I find uh, T1J, YouTuber T1J, had a, he had a shirt. He says, uh, oh, what was it? C uh, it's an anti-cynicism t-shirt anyway. And I was like, I got to get that. Like, that. <laughs> like I don't, I don't want to be cynical. I want to be like, the world can get better. Things can yeah. be, we can be honest. We can be truthful. We can follow reality and things can still improve. Absolutely. Like we can, being... Being honest about what we're experiencing and the truth is not negative inherently. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, and like you said, we don't have to like lay into that cynicism. We can we can continue believing the reality of the world, but also believing that we can do better. Like, don't you want better? Like, even if it's pretend, like you pretend about other stuff. Like, yeah, you pretend that's right. you your job. Why can't we? You pretend that we can like be free you know i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's where i'm at right now I'm like please and anybody somebody yeah so i guess actually we're at about 50 minutes like so there's not a, a whole lot of time left but is there anything you want to bring up specifically that maybe we haven't touched on hmm. i guess we haven't even talked about your channel really <laughs> i guess so yeah <laughs> So, so I just like connecting with people, you know, yeah, that's awesome. yeah. <laughs> this is just the convo where we talk about theory, but like, I don't have to like talk about theory, you know, right. like, <laughs> I, I, I learn about theory through people's experiences, you know? So yeah, I, uh, I hope this isn't like off the rails or anything. <laughs> oh no, this is perfect. I, I, I do this mostly, like you say, to connect with other leftists of various types and like, just to get, you know, a little bit of back and forth so I, I can adapt my own understanding of things. Oh, totally. I feel you. And that's why I was excited to do this. I want to, I watched a few episodes that I really enjoyed. Um, yeah. And I think it's important to really like hold space for each other and learn about each other. And sure. like I've been saying before, like there's not very many of us out there as anarchists. So I, I just like, being able to connect on that level but yeah i can talk a little bit about my channel sure. um i have a youtube channel um <laughs> <laughs> i um i consider my main topics three categories where i just talk about theory or any of my opinions through my always anarchist and intersectional feminist lens like i view everything through that so i'll talk about everything but the main categories are our activism and subculture I grew up as a punk kid, so I'll talk about music and punk and politics and things like that. And when I do talk about theory, it's mostly about American politics. But I've ha I have talked about um, people that I like across the diaspora and globally. Um, so, yeah, it's mostly whatever I want to do. But <laughs> Right. Oh, I, I've, I've quite appreciated the content of yours that I've watched. Like you have a, a great video on mutual aid. Um, you're one of the more recent ones that I watched was your Kendrick and Jay and Drake video. I <laughs> like that one. Um, uh, and yeah, I, uh, you did one on, uh, the, uh, what was it? The Asada Shakur of, uh, Palestine. Yeah. 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 <laughs> was... Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Leila Khaled. Um, I love her so much. Um, she's so awesome. And she is the Asada Shakur of Palestine because she was, exiled in the same way and they're both still alive and around the same age and right. i just i saw the connection immediately um between the two of them when i saw how 
fearless, like I said before, talking about having no fear. They were willing to risk everything for the liberation of their people. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I just think they're badass, and they still yeah. have that fire about them. Um, in the in the recent interviews that they have of them both, Asada really doesn't talk to anybody anymore which i totally understand like the media has always twisted her words so she's probably like fuck you people yeah for sure (laughs) i'm chilling with my grandkids which um oh not her grandkids sorry i always forget that she hasn't been able to see them in person but Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. she's she's able to like skype and stuff like that from what i understand but same with layla like she isn't able to see like all of her family and so, um, but they still have that fire about them, which I really appreciate and I love them. So I appreciate you saying that. And yeah, same with like the Drake and Kendrick video. Like I saw everybody talking about like just the hip hop part of it. And I'm like, right. hello, there's like so much misogyny here. Like, <laughs> so I had to make, I had to make a video about that. And similar to what you were saying before about like just making concepts like smaller and digestible for folks that was my my uh theory and like intention behind the mutual aid video because i often find like i know i look young but i'm 32 but i talk to a lot of um younger uh activists a lot like mostly on youtube and tiktok on my platforms when i talk there um and they're often saying like i don't know what to do like they said like we were talking about before people are justifiably upset and overwhelmed but this is like right before they become nihilistic because they want to do something so i was yeah. like i need to catch people before they say fuck it it doesn't matter you know yeah and right. explain to them that like mutual aid is like you helping your friend get to their job you know like you you're already doing it just keep doing it yeah yeah for Think sure bigger, you know <laughs> yeah that's awesome no i uh i can say i uh, quite enjoy your channel i'm gonna keep watching so uh, i would encourage anybody who sees this to also go and check it out yeah thanks yeah i I make videos whenever i have time i have more time now um so i'm hoping to make a couple videos a month uh, about the world and everything that's going on but yeah I, i appreciate you watching and and engaging with me and it's it's how we met each other so i think that's really cool um and sure. yeah, I, I I hope you keep doing what you're doing. It's important for people to be able to connect with each other and really just talk about things that are important that don't really have a platform. We have to make our own, you know? Yeah, that's right. I guess the only thing uh, left before we go is uh, what are some places people can ch- find you on the internet? Sure. Um, so uh, my YouTube channel is lucretia mac evil i'll spell it it's always hard for people <laughs> it's a funk song i'm sorry to everybody um <laughs> that's l-u-r-e-t oh sorry i forgot the c l-u-c-r-e-t-i-a underscore m-a-c-e-v-i-l that's my youtube it's the same on my instagram all of my links are under snipfeed.com slash mickevil, though. I made it easier. I have <laughs> yeah. all of my social me- links there, so you can follow that there. Right on. Well, thank you very much for your time, and uh, I hope you have a great day. Thanks, Corey. All right, folks, that's all for now. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share the show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me keep the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Damian Marie Athope, uh, Some Random Geek, Justin Clark, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to my new patrons. You can stay tuned for the list of patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a patron and want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skepticalleftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. I also have a Substack where you can subscribe for free or you can donate per month. And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes. If you can't contribute financially, then I'd like on YouTube or a five-star rating on a, and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff, 
or check out my link tree. Uh, it's linktr.ee slash skeptical leftist. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda.